All right, guys, come on. Come on, it's time for breakfast. Let's go. Bessie. Martha Scott loves caring for the animals on her ranch. Both my husband and I, that's, that's where our hearts are. We're kind of Western lifestyle people and to be able to live like this and in this place and have, you know, this facility may not look like much to anybody else, but it's everything to us. We love it here and to have our animals and, and uh, our little minis, they're just a joy. They're just a blessing to us. Come here, Miss Bell. Come here, honey. Come here, darling. Come but for here. over a year, Martha couldn't care for her beloved animals. Her neck Bella. and shoulders hurt too much. Bella. I couldn't even lift the saddle or do my regular chores here around the barn. Um, I've got several horses to take care of and, and uh, we do a little boarding uh, and it just, it was becoming impossible. I couldn't even lift the fork to, to muck the stalls out and that's pretty bad when you live, <laughs> live on the farm. Come on, let's go. Let's go! Come on, big stuff. Martha's pet steer, Mr. Tough Enough, lives on the farm too. Martha raised him from when he was two days old. He loves to be groomed and to have the curry comb taken to him. And I just, the motion that that takes and the reaching and stuff was just, just too hard. So he kind of got set aside as, as did a lot of the animals here. Hardest of all was not being able to play with her new grand nephew. When the baby came, I couldn't even pick him up and hold him, you know? I mean, I had to be sitting down and I could put him in my lap, but, you know, that was just killing me. Martha needed help. Her primary physician referred her to Dr. Virani Hillard at the University of Washington Medical Center's Bone and Joint Surgery Center. Do you have any pain back there? A little bit. Okay. Dr. Hillard is a good match for Martha. She's just as passionate about her work as Martha is about ranching. The neuroanatomy has always been uh, very intriguing to me, and I just love the little details of it. And so and I feel privileged that I'm working with patients and doing surgery on them and then trying to recreate and just, um, you know, put it back in a way that it looks like we haven't even been there. Dr. Hillard is a neurosurgeon specializing in spine. Miss Scott came in with neck pain that radiated down uh, her left arm with numbness and tingling in her thumb and first finger. A look at one of Martha's MRI images shows what was causing her pain. This midline structure gives us a sneak peek of your brain stem, which is connected to your spinal cord, which is this solid uh, tube here, this gray tube. And the solid tube should have white space, which is actually the cerebral spinal fluid that cushions the spine and protects it. The first cervical uh, bone is C1, this big one is C2, this would be C3, C4, C5, and C6. And right away you can actually see there's an abnormality here in between the bones of C5 and C6. This is the C5-C6 disc, and there's a portion of that disc that's uh, jutted out into the canal, and in her case, it's a little bit off to one side, which is the left side, and this is the reason for her left arm pain. So this, the nerve that supplies the portion of her uh, fingers that's um, numb and tingling is coming from um, this area, and the disc happens to be sitting along that nerve there. Shrug your shoulder. We're going to check the strength in your arms. Dr. Um, Hillard talked with Martha about her options for treatment. Good. She wanted to know what um, avenues I had pursued, and really, before I went to see her, I feel like I had really pursued almost every avenue, and, and so she was more than willing to see if I wanted to continue down that road, or if I was, you know, really felt that surgery was really the next step, and I was just really at the end of my pain level and my tolerance for for not being able to do anything. And I, I was ready uh, for the surgery, and so she was very willing to then go ahead and say, well, then that's what we need to do. It's about an inch long for a one-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Martha's surgery was an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. It requires only a small incision along a skin crease at the front of the neck. Radiology confirms that Dr. Hillard is operating at the correct level of the spine. She removes the disc between the two bony vertebrae. This is the disc that was putting pressure on the nerve and causing pain. So that's wide open, that's completely relaxed. I'm gonna see if we can curette just a little bit more here. 
After the disc is removed, Dr. Hillard prepares a bone graft. Great. See, the caliper is nice and parallel. It tells us the height of this graft is going to be at least six, maybe even seven. The graft must be made to fit precisely. It will fit in the space between the vertebrae where the disc used to be. Dr. Hillard attaches a thin metal plate to further stabilize the structure while the bone and graft are growing together. And I can show you her three months uh, x-ray and this is what uh, an anterior, uh, an AP or anterior posterior image looks like uh, face on. You can see we have a small little plate right over the uh, disc space of C5-6 which is here. There are four screws holding the disc together and here's a side view and what was uh, nicely shown in this three months uh, x-ray here is that even at three months you can see that you can no longer tell that there's a disc there such as these other level here but there's a piece of bone graft and it's actually grown nicely across from the C5 bone to the C6 bone which is the fusion portion of this operation. Martha stayed in the hospital one night and went home the next afternoon. Five months after her surgery, she's getting back to her very active life. I feel like I'm doing really well, but to actually be able to come out here, do my regular chores, and then still have energy to go on and do something else with my day has been terrific. Patients who come to the Bone and Joint Surgery Center have access to a team of specialists with an arsenal of treatment options for spine problems. Hey Dave, why don't you bring Wynn with you? Not every patient will need surgery. Take Jonathan Young, who really didn't like it when back pain sideswiped his active lifestyle. I was uh, refereeing soccer uh, last fall, high school soccer, and uh, I was starting to get a severe limp and a lot of leg pain. So. It got to the point where it was extremely painful to stand, walk, and sit. To the point where uh, when I was driving in the car, I was just screaming at myself to distract me from the pain. So that's, that's how, how bad it was. Jonathan worried that he wouldn't ever be able to sail again. He's got a stressful job as a safety consultant in the nuclear power industry. Sailing is an activity that relaxes him. I'm allegedly retired, but I still do consult and uh, there's still a lot of stress associated with the business that I'm in and coming out here is a great way to decompress because you're just worried about the currents, the tides, the wind, the weather and uh, you get to spend time with friends so it's really it's really kind of a nice escape so I really miss that and the thought of not being able to do that was uh, was pretty frightening too so, because uh, Again, this is kind of an outlet and a relaxation. His physician's referral sent Jonathan to Dr. Marla Kaufman at the Bone and Joint Center. And uh, the thing I liked about it was that uh, she's really into rehab and not into surgery, and I wasn't really into surgery myself, if we can avoid it. So, so we had a couple of visits, and uh, she evaluated my situation. Um, we traced it had an MRI, traced it back to a condition I had, which is a congenital condition. It's called stenosis, where the, the exit of the nerve from the spine narrow. They got a lot of bony tissue there. And as, as you get older and your discs collapse, you tend to rub on the nerves. That's not a good idea. Dr. Kaufman works with patients who have spinal disorders and sports injuries. Her evaluation of Jonathan's condition led to non-surgical treatment. One of the nerves that was going down his leg was getting irritated. So we decided to proceed with a couple different things. Uh, number one, we decided to proceed with an epidural steroid injection. And the purpose of that was to deliver steroid, which is a really powerful anti-inflammatory, right to that area that was getting irritated to see if we could decrease his symptoms. Another shot, please. After that, when his symptoms were somewhat improved, we got him into some physical therapy, really working on a good core stability program. Dr. Kaufman performs the epidural steroid injection procedures on site at the Bone and Joint Center, just down the hall from her office. I'm going to move the needle a little bit, and then take a picture, and then we'll move the needle a little bit more. Okay, we'll keep going. You're doing okay?
We numb up the skin really well. Put the needle in. Take a picture with the x-ray machine and keep going back and forth until we're in the right position. We check a bunch of different views in order to create a 3D, 3D picture. So we have 2D pictures and a couple different views to create a 3D picture in our minds. The needle looks like it's in a good position. We're going to check one more view. Can you check a straight AP, please? Put some contrast dye in in order to make sure that the medication is going in the right place. And more importantly, it's not going into the wrong place. And then we put the medication in. OK, that picture looks great. You doing OK? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I'm just putting the medicine in here now. All right, a couple more seconds. Great, we're all done. If I'm going to be performing injections on my patients, I generally use it as a tool, as one of the tools in my toolbox. I don't generally use it as a sole treatment. So often I'll use it in conjunction with physical therapy, sometimes oral medications, um, and what other other treatments they're going through too. But generally I use it in conjunction with uh, other treatments as well. I was uh, really pleased with the uh, care I got there. Uh, Dr. Kaufman presented me with a lot of alternatives. Uh, we discussed them and uh, I chose uh, the one epidural and physical therapy which uh, worked out pretty well for me. And she also uh, encouraged a lot of follow-up appointments to assess my progress. That was good too. So overall I was very pleased with how it all turned out. For some patients, less invasive treatments may eventually be followed by surgery. That was the case with Chad Oishi, an active guy who likes to play hard and work hard. I'm a workaholic and so I, I work 12 hours a day uh, on my feet on concrete. Uh, and when I could no longer uh, be effective at work, um, when I couldn't do anything with my kids, um, when I couldn't do the things I enjoyed to do, uh, I started, really I started to panic. You usually just sit there for a long time in pain. And so all, he used to just be in pain all the time. Just never got up, did anything. Family life is happier now for the Oishis. But not long ago, Chad couldn't do much at home or on the job. At some point, it became unbearable to go to work. Um, kept trying, uh, would go to work for a couple of days and then have to take time off. And in my, in my job, not very effective. Um, and so at some point, I had to just stop and take care of it. Initially, Chad did not want to undergo surgery for his back pain. Dr. Kaufman helped him explore other possibilities. I wanted to try every other means to get back, uh, get back my life. There was a lot of things that, you know, that I looked at. Is this, is this behavioral? Is it psychological, right? Um, and I thought it was really, uh, really a prudent call for for, from Dr. Kaufman about going and trying other, other means. He did have a large disc extrusion, so a herniated disc, that was um, irritating the nerve root, causing the symptoms down his leg. And so at that point, Chad and I sat down and we discussed the whole realm of treatments. And we discussed multiple options, such as physical therapy, medications, injections. And we actually did discuss whether or not surgery was indicated at that point. At that point, neurologically, he was stable, he was not weak, he wasn't having any loss of sensation, and we decided to proceed with uh, two epidural steroid injections. You're going to feel me numbing your skin here, one, two, three. Like Jonathan Young, many patients experience significant relief after the procedure, but Chad still had a lot of pain. Dr. Kaufman referred Chad to Dr. Michael Lee, an orthopedic spine surgeon and another member of the team of specialists at the Bone and Joint Surgery Center. Hello, it's Dr. Lee. While he was getting uh, his second injection, he also was already scheduled to see Dr. Lee. Um, so it was pretty seamless. Dr. Lee was able to access his imaging right on the computer. Um, he had my notes, and since I had talked to Dr. Lee, he knew what was going on and had a really good idea of what the case was all about. I did spend some time with Chad because I do like to get to know my patients on my own, but I felt like I sort of knew him already before he walked into my clinic. And that's kind of the beauty of the system that we have with, uh, here at the Roosevelt Bone and Joint Center is that we have this collaborative spine effort. 
the treatment of spine is not strictly surgical or injections or physical therapy. It's really a broad spectrum of many treatments that can be done to help people with spine uh, ailments. So to have sort of an all-encompassing approach for the spine here in one building is really convenient, not only for me as a physician, but most importantly for the patient. I appreciated the fact that we were taking every measure possible prior to going into surgery with a young family and, and making that decision. Uh, you want to make sure your healthcare professional is, is taking all the precautions, and I really felt like I got that from Dr. Kaufman and from Dr. Lee. So this is a uh, sideways view of Chad's spine. This is the, the front part of his body, this is the back side. So as we go down, and go down to his spine, we see, that his, we, we see his vertebrae here, and we see his discs here become a little bit darker. You can see that these discs are darker, which indicates some dehydration, which is really normal uh, for anyone, uh, for, it's, it's part of the normal aging process. As we scroll through his spine, you can see that here he's got this disc herniation, which is going back into the spinal canal. You can see this is absent at the other levels. This is how the spine is supposed to look at these levels, and you can see he's a pretty prominent disc herniation going back, pushing into the spine at what we call the L5-S1 level. When I met with Dr. Lee, it was, you know, kind of, he walked us through what the, the surgery would entail. And uh, when he started showing us, you know, the incision size and, and what he was going to do, um, and kind of explained what the procedure was, um, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It was much less invasive than I thought. Um, the actual incision area was smaller than I thought it would be. Um, so I probably went into it with a lot of preconceived ideas, but at the same time, I was amazed with his thought process on how he was going to go about fixing it. Surgically, what we do is we make an incision right here, and we gently approach the spine, and we, uh, we approach this bone here. This bone here is called a lamina and we do a little bit of a laminotomy where we take off some of the bone uh, and take off the underlying soft tissue to expose the spine. We gently, gently pull the spine in this direction and we have a good exposure of the uh, disc herniation at this level. At this point we remove the disc herniation and we make sure that the nerve roots and the, the nerves, nerve roots are free and they're moving and they're relatively decompressed. This is a microdiscectomy and this is what we did for Chad. When I did go into surgery they actually removed a section of the disc. Um, and just instant relief. It was an amazing deal to wake up from surgery and not have any pain, um, especially after going through what I had gone through basically for five weeks prior to. So it was amazing. A large number of people will have back pain sometime in their lifetime. Uh, there's a statistic that says that 8 out of 10 Americans will experience low back pain at some time in their life. So it can be the 20 year old with low back pain who hurt their back during a soccer game or an 80 year old who's having difficulty walking in the grocery store because of their leg and back pain. And so we really aim to treat all of them. Physicians at the University of Washington Medical Center's Bone and Joint Surgery Center use state-of-the-art research and technology to expand treatment options for spine patients. This is a very exciting time to be in spine care. Um, there are many, many new technologies um, emerging within spine surgery itself. Um, disc replacements in the lumbar spine and the cervical spine are, have been uh, in use uh, in the United States recently, longer in Europe. Uh, there are different strategies for fusing the spine, which is one of our uh, great tools in spine. Uh, biological care, a lot of the spine surgical approaches has been primarily biomechanical with uh, screws and rods and a uh, fixation. Uh, we're now starting to delve into bio the biological treatment of spine and uh, maintenance of discs. One new development we have in, in the cervical spine is that the FDA has approved two new discs uh, device, which are actually disc replacement device. Um, if you think of the disc in between the bone above and below as a joint, this is basically a new joint. So just like patients would have uh, a shoulder joint replaced uh, or a knee joint replaced, we have newer te technology now to actually replace the joint in the cervical spine, which is the actual disc. And, and the advantages of these new technology is that if you put in a, a disc replacement, then the patient will be able to maintain their neck motion, um, which is important for their function. 
and people who can function without pain can get back to enjoying what's important in their lives. Okay, ready about? Ready. Helmsley. Jonathan Young is sailing again. Just being out on the boat is uh, what it's all about for most of us sailors. We always say that uh, motor boaters are trying to get somewhere and when we're on the boat, we're there. So, so this is what we're, we enjoy. <laughs> Chad Oishi can enjoy sports with his son. I'm glad that when I did finally have the surgery done, um, the results were just outstanding. Martha Scott can perform all the strenuous farm chores that she loves to do. Ready? And she can play with her grandnephew Robbie again. Oh, what a big man. Oh, what a big man. I'm glad he's he's around and I can he's bigger and I'm stronger and, and I can enjoy him to the fullest extent now. So it's just really given me my life back. Woohoo! We can ride again! Yay! Yay! For more information, to make an appointment, or to refer a patient, contact the University of Washington Medical Center Bone and Joint Surgery Center at 206-598-4288 or on the web at www.orthop.washington.edu or www dot neurosurgery dot uwmedicine dot org.